Welcome to Shul.com. We are here learning this morning the practical guide for a Ben Torah. It's a simple book written by Solomon Mishan Mercado. Uh, very easy book, uh, organizing uh, Melukat, all different ideas. Today we're talking about Hilul Hashem. What is Hilul Hashem? So everyone looks at us. We must be very careful doing everything, especially people who are Orthodox Yehudim, since thousands of eyes are on us anywhere, anytime. Once, the Hafez Haim asked his son, Rav Arya Leb, to be very careful in all his actions from day to day, trying not to make mistakes in his behavior. Rav Ari asked his father, why should I be so careful? Am I someone so important that people learn something from me? The Hafez Haim replied, it's not so that people learn from you, but because there are, there are many waiting for you to do something wrong so that they can speak negatively about you and consequently about all the Talmidei Chachamim. This is brought down in Umatok Ha'or, Parashat Emor 376 and 77. So the Hafez Hayim who wrote the book on Lashon Hara was, is kind of giving a heads up that people are looking to speak negatively about Talmidei Chachamim and people in the religious world. So what you need to do is you have to be extra careful because they're looking specifically at the Orthodox Jews. The Gemara in Masechet Yoma 86a asks, what is a Chilul Hashem? Good question. We're talking about doing it, but what is it in essence? So, a, so for example, Rabbi Yohanan once walked two meters without tefillin and without studying Torah. Rashi explains that Rabbi Yohanan had a stomach ache and that's the reason why he couldn't study. But in the end, people didn't know that he was sick and they learned from him. So what happened? Rabbi Yohanan, he normally wore his tefillin every single day. I'm assuming talit and tefillin uh, every day. One day he didn't do it. And for him, not walking two meters, six feet, uh, was considered a heilul Hashem. It's interesting. You didn't think that that would be the, the example to give an eye. You might have thought something different, but let's continue. We see from here that a Tamid Hacham or a Ben Torah is an example to people and his actions can be an inspiration to everybody. But also, he can make the Hilul Hashem even unintentionally, without even knowing that he's doing it. That's why it's so important to behave correctly since many people seek to criticize what we do wrong. And it's, there's, there's nothing in essence wrong knowing that people are going to want to speak bad because... The Torah really, really tells us it's not mini orav that the the form of the human being was wicked from its onset, and one of the reasons why that is is because who came first, the yetsar hara or yetsar hatov? In the body, the yetsar hara. The yetsar hara comes from the time the person's born. When does yetsar hatov come in? When he's bar mitzvah. So he has a thirteen-year heads up on being able to learn the individual. So for 13 years, from birth until 13, the Yitzhak Hara, he's watching you. He knows everything about you. He remembers how you were as a kid. He remembers what experiences you had, any childhood trauma, any physical, mental uh, issues. He knows you. Now at age 13 comes a new friend inside. He's your Yitzhak Tov. He's the guy who tells you, okay, I'm here to, to give you some good advice. But uh, he's a new friend. It takes time to make friends with him. It takes time to trust him. So the person trusts the Yetzir Hara oftentimes more. The Rambam already said it clearly. There is no forgiveness for the sin of Chilul Hashem, but just death. So death is, is not forgiveness as much as it is Kapara. It's a Kapara that by leaving the world, that in essence um, uh, absolves it to a certain extent. That's Hilchot Teshuvah 1-4. Now we'll mention some real examples in which perhaps many of us fall. It's incorrect to get into a queue or we'll call this an argument, without, uh, or, or, or a queue, or um, like waiting in line, without waiting our time. This makes Hilul Hashem. So what does that mean, not waiting in the queue in the line? Uh, let's say now Yeshiva Week's coming up in two weeks, and, uh, and we're here in Miami, so some people go out to uh, Orlando. So you're in Orlando, and you have an ability, ah, you're online, you see the line is one hour and 37 minutes long even with your fast pass, even with all your friends that you know in Disney, yeah, okay, you have to wait 37 minutes. But you see a friend from Shul. He's online already. 
and he's wearing a yarmulke, he's wearing his kippah. And you tell him, hey, hey, Yid, how are you? Shalom Aleichem. And now everyone's watching, and suddenly you sneak you, your wife, and your four kids, or five kids, and you sneak them into the line. That's not winning your turn. That would be considered Hidul Hashem. Lying to get a discount is prohibited. Same thing, we'll use the theme park of Orlando. Comes into the middle of the park. How old's your son? Uh, tell him you're four. What do you mean, tell him you're four? Dad, I'm eight. <laughs> no, nah, you're not that tall. It's okay. You tell him you're four. What? To save what? To save $47? So now you, 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 you did the Gvar Sheket Tit Haki. You decided $47 that you saved. Okay, it's worth it. We lied, we lied to Disney. It doesn't make a, di- a big deal. For example, it's not allowed to lie about the age of our children so that we can have a special discount. In addition to lying, we make the grave sin of Hilul Hashem. So it's two things. There's the issue of midvar sheket et chak, don't lie. And then also, achilul Hashem. If we have to use a mask somewhere, and, or, or people are taking special care in health and hygiene, we have to follow the rule just like everyone else. We have to respect the rules and to those around us not, to not make achilul Hashem. Okay, this is what he has in the book, but I'm going to give you my comment about the mask. It's quite um, commonly known today that the masks don't prevent disease. We have a doctor here in the room. I'm sure the doctor can concur with me that the masks don't do what they say they do. And even if you were to say that the masks helps, they don't help for viruses because you would need an N95 and you need much more, much more precautions than just that little flimsy mask you bought from Walgreens uh, uh, for, for 99 cents just so that, that you made everybody happy. So just as a side note, it's important to know that because the same way we use Chokhmah to learn Torah, we use Chokhmah to assess science, medicine, and also the reality of what's being told to us. So that's just a side point in regards to the mask because there have been places, like for example, I, I saw myself in a shul where you had the Hazan, you had the Rabbi, you had a few people in the shul not wearing a mask, telling everybody else to wear a mask. And, I, and one of the guys that they told, told them, don't tell me not to wear a mask. He said, you have a hazan standing literally three feet away from me without a, without a mask, sitting and praying, and all the, uh, the vapor and everything coming out. If you're so concerned, then don't have the hazan uh, go without a mask. Don't. And, he, and he made a whole stink about it. And I don't think he was wrong. I think the idea is that everyone has to care for themselves in whatever capacity that means. If someone needs to be extra more careful, that's in the same way if someone in the synagogue cannot eat dairy, he's lactose intolerant, and suddenly you have a deluxe breakfast in the morning, he has to be extra careful. And everyone has to take the precautions necessary for them. And, and obviously, you know, we, wanna, we want everyone to be safe and healthy in the general realm of where we are as a group. Um, we can't be oblivious that there are other people here. Uh, it's not correct to talk to people showing arrogance, presumption, or conceit by thinking that we're more important than others. This triggers Hilul Hashem. By, what does that mean? That means that sometimes when you speak, you might make people feel that they're not important. And so by making them feel unimportant, you're making a Hilul Hashem. You're making I'm, I'm better, I'm bigger than you. You understand? What makes a Gadol? You know, this was a famous question uh, Rabbi Yossi ben Shushan was talking about. He said, what's the difference between a rabbi and a gadol? What's the difference between the two? So he said, very simple. He said, when you, sometimes you meet a great rabbi, you say, wow, that's an awe-inspiring individual. It's fantastic. I couldn't believe how holy he was. What's the difference between a gadol? When you leave a gadol, you know what you say? You say, how? Oh, wow, how big of a person I am. He made me feel so great. The difference is you walk away, he's great. You walk away, that you're great big difference between a, ra- a big rabbi and a gadol. If, if minyan in public places makes trouble, or if it's prohibited in a certain place, it shouldn't be done. This triggers Hilul Hashem. Okay, that's true, uh, but I want to make another comment on the book. Yeah, I, I'm going to make I'm going to make a few exemptions on it. One of them being that we're in the United States of America. There is freedom of a religion. The freedom of religion allows that religion to be practiced anywhere and everywhere. And the same way our cousins, the Muslims, can go to Times Square and close off an entire area to pray, we have to learn from them. What do we learn from them? That we should not be embarrassed to pray also in public, and not, all, not be embarrassed to make a minyan in public, and not be able to gather together. Because we're coming to praise God, the God that powers the energy of everything in this entire world. 
So of course, it has to be done the chokhmah, but we also have to know our rights. And there's a certain right that a person that we have as Jewish people to come and gather and and in order to ha- establish our religion and to practice it freely. This was why the founding fathers came to this country. Why did they establish America? They were in Britain. They were in Europe. They didn't want to have a king who would tell them how to practice their religion. And that's why the foundation of this country was freedom of religion. And if we look around the room, we can see that almost all of us came or descend from another country that was not America. And we all left for one reason only. They restricted our freedom of religion. There's no other reason why we left. I know myself, my parents are Lebanese refugees, my grandfather's an Iraqi refugee. They only left those two countries because of pogroms and for the inability to practice their religion. We know we have John over here, from, uh, originally from Bukhara, from Uzbekistan. If I'm not mistaken, you're from Iran, correct? Also, when the Shah fell in Iran, I think it was, what, in 1969? Uh, 79, in 79, when he, when, when he fell, what happened? All the Jews realized that the Islamic revolution happening there would not allow them to practice freely. I have a friend who was the Shamosh in SLC in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, his name was Kohen Sasson. Uh, he has a son, Herzl, Kohen Sasson. Uh, he paid, the father told me, the father was a multimillionaire in Iran. He paid in 19, early 1980s $1 million U.S. dollars in order uh, to pay ransom to leave the country of Iran. $1 million in 1980, 79-80. Does anyone want to have a reference to dollars? My father bought his house, I think, in 1981 on East 12 and Avenue S for $70,000. So you have a reference to what money was and what the power of money was. In you could have bought a building in Manhattan for half a million dollars. They would have given it to you for free in 1981 for that price. For half a million dollars, they would have given you a tower of 40 stories, as, and some people did invest in them. Uh, so that's, that's an interesting uh, point. Let's continue. As we have mentioned, provoking Chilul Hashem is such a serious offense that it deserves the death penalty. However, there is a solution to fix it. Do Kiddush Hashem. That's the op- complete opposite of Kiddush Hashem. That is to sanctify Hashem's name. This brought down Chad Teshuvah 4-5. If someone has already made Chidul Hashem and wants to mend the serious sin, from that moment, you can be an example for others and behave in such a way that people say, I want to be like that religious person. That's Kiddush Hashem. That's brought down in Netivei or, or under Chidul Hashem. Be very careful with your actions when driving a car. It's necessary to have good manners. It's not correct to drive impatiently, but to respect the right of others. This road rage is a big thing today. A guy cut someone off. Suddenly, the vulgar language that you hear from him, you, you, you'd never heard in your entire life. And, yes? Also, a lot of times when you're driving and somebody's doing something bad in front of you, let's say, then you drive around and see it could be the rabbi. Yeah, it could be someone that you, you're unexpected. Yeah. Listen, yeah. Uh, uh, people are people. You know, for many years, even now, for the most part, I usually don't drive with a kippah on or I wear a hat. Not that I, I drive uh, uh, carelessly, but sometimes you, you're just going to drive in a way that's just not going to suit other people. It, it's just it's just not. Unless the guy wants to drive 20 miles an hour and go just in the right lane, and let everyone pass him. For the most part, you're going to drive sometimes in a way that might be uh, uh, considered, uh, uh, you know, questionable. And so, do it bit uh, Unfortunately, you rarely see a driver letting you cross the street. Sometimes there's a lot of traffic, and the drivers honk all the time as this, as if this will solve the problem. Uh, we don't really hear this issue of the honking here, Baruch Hashem in Miami, coming from Brooklyn, New York. You don't hear it much here, o- or at all, for that matter. You know what? I remember I was at a light once and it was like 30 seconds and nobody even honked. It was unbelievable. Baruch Hashem, certain things about Miami you could enjoy. The only thing they, they may gain is to release a little pressure. That's for sure. But they cause more stress to those around them. So he releases pressure and he gave, it to, he gave it to his neighbor. He gave it to the next guy over there. Nor should we park the car in a place that is prohibited or that disturbs the public. Okay, that's, a, that's another fa- famous thing, parking. There's no parking anywhere, especially in Brooklyn. It's, it's unbelievable. And not only is, is there no parking, 
they keep taking away whatever parking spots there are. Sometimes there are parking spots and they eliminate them. Or sometimes there's, the lane is, is a four-lane road and they eliminate two just for the bus. So now you went from a four-lane highway getting to work in seven minutes, getting to work in 27 minutes because they eliminated 50% of the lane of traffic. And, and this, this, is, this is actually, it's, it's happened, it happened very common. I remember when it happened in Brooklyn where I, where I was working, they literally doubled the time it took me to go to work because they eliminated 50% of the, of the traffic. And I made a calculation how many vehicles were going versus buses. And it was like maybe five times more vehicles than there were buses, which meant that the majority of people were actually driving not on the bus, which meant the minority, were, which were the people that were uh, the numbers of people that were on the bus were way less than those driving, and they ended up having that. Uh, this provokes Chilul Hashem and is disrespectful to the right of others. When someone studies Torah and makes mitzvot, he should do it with joy and demonstrate it. The Torah already said it clearly. Tachat asher lo avata et Hashem eloecha besimcha uftuv levav. That's Deferim 28-47. Because you did not serve Hashem with joy. The Torah tells us that Hashem sent all the curses of Parashat Ki Tavo. We really don't call them curses. We call them tochachot. Uh, for not serving Him with joy. As brought down in Mesilat Yesharim, chapter 19, and in the Peleo Et Simcha. As the Rambam writes, whoever fulfills the Torah mitzvot without joy, he will be held accountable. He's going to have an accounting that Hashem said, I gave you all this good, and all you did with it is make it a burden upon yourself. You even know, if you do the mitzvah, you do the mitzvah. Yes, even. It, the and this is where Halachot Nulav 8 Asher 15. Why? No, let, me, let me tell you why, and, and, and then we'll continue with the, with the next part. Uh, this, this is a very important component. This is why, for the most part, I, I try not to be mahmir on mitzvot in mass. If there's a certain mitzvah that you, you like, Okay, then you want to be mahmir, you want to be stringent, okay. But to make, uh, to make the entire religion just being stringent on every single thing that you're doing, I find that it's more of an addiction than it is of actual kedusha. And I'll tell you why. Because we, ha- we very rarely do mitzvot to the level of simcha and of knowledge, which means... Are we already putting on our Rashi Tefillin every morning with the most simcha? Do we understand the kavanot? Are we praying from the beginning of the tefillah, from Patah Eliyahu until Alel Shabayah with our tefillin on perfectly, that we already are adding on a second tefillin and that we're already uh, adding more, more things and doing and, and affecting our tefillah? And so I try to always focus on the mitzvah that we have to do, understand it, go deeper into the mitzvah, God said, who told you to do all this extra stuff? Do what I told you. Do it right. Do it from your heart. During Arat Simcha. Now, why is it? You asked a good question. Why is it that if a person doesn't do it with Simcha, does Hashem get mad? You know why? Because we are not fully trained in understanding how much good is coming out of this. If you go to a doctor and the doctor says to you, here, take, this, um, take these vitamins and supplements, it will help you to become stronger. So that your immunity will, will be strong and you and you won't you won't get sick. So you get mad at him. You take it every morning. You tell him, I "Can't believe it! You made me take these supplements. Could you believe it? Look at this! I I, I did it! I did it! What do you mean you did it? Who who benefited from this? You or him? The doctor. God is the manufacturer of the vehicle. Just like if I if I bought myself a uh, a Ferrari. I would probably recommend that it gets service from Ferrari and not from Ford. I'm sure Ford would love to, to play and tinker with that Ferrari and tell you that they'll do a great job and put the best oil, synthetic oil in it. But I'd rather Ferrari who understands it. And God who understands the mankind and understands human beings and understands the Jewish people, the nation that he chose, he understood which supplements and vitamins are going to do you good. So when you take them with Simha, you know what you're doing? You're telling God, I believe you. I believe that what, you, what you're giving me is the right vitamins and supplements. And sometimes you don't want to take them. But you have to know it's for our benefit. And so doing it with simha is a big component because it shows your love of the Borei Olam. Let's go to the next part, which I thought is a great part that he has in the book. What's the dress code of a Ben Torah? Or even is there a dress code? Does wearing a white shirt and black pants make you more religious? Or maybe not. 
If you look at the Sfaradim rabbis, we'll leave aside the European jury, because most of us are Sfaradim here, but if you look at Sfaradim rabbis, they were always very simple. One of them particularly, which I learned a lot from, was Rabbi Salman Musafi, who was almost invisible. That's what they called modesty. Modesty, the best way to, to uh, define what modesty is, is, is inv- invisible. You don't have to explain it anymore. If you're, if you're visible, then that modesty level goes up. If you are invisible and people don't even notice who you are, that's already the modesty part. It's already it's hidden. Tzitzit and kippah. Every ben Torah must wear talit katan, tzitzit, during the day, even if it's very hot. This brought down in Igrot Moshe Yure De'a 3-52. Now, as a, as a side note, if a person went his entire life and never wore tzitzit, he never made an avera. It's important to tell you guys that. I'm not going to lie to you or trick to you. There's no avera. But for the same time, you don't have to be rich in life. <coughs> no. So the Torah stated, if you have a four-cornered garment, then you need to put strings on it. If you don't have a four-cornered garment, you don't have to wear strings on it. So, a person doesn't have a four-cornered garment, he doesn't have to wear strings. Now, it happens to be today, we don't have any four-cornered garments for the most part in the Western world. But, uh, I had a, uh, my father had a worker, he was from Senegal in Africa, and my father speaks French, so he, he gets only French employees to work for him. And he had this worker for years, and for 20 years. I remember when he told me, I'm going back to my country. I said, oh, you're going back to Senegal? I said to him, listen, when you go back, get me something from Africa that's not available here. I know you're here for, for 20 years. Don't get me anything you can find in America. Get me something wild, something interesting. I said, okay. He went there. He brought me back a beautiful tunic, handmade tunic. Only thing was, it was the first time in my life I got a, a garment that was a four-cornered garment that needed tzitzit. I didn't end up wearing it because that was hayav, that big was hayav. Now, if a person doesn't wear four corners, it doesn't have to wear tzitzit. For the same part, what I'm trying to tell you is that you don't have to be rich in life. You can, a person can just get by regularly. Ah, you want to be rich? You got to do extra things to be rich. Same thing is, is, is with, the, with life in Torah mitzvot. You want to become rich in mitzvot? You got a free, a free uh, gift. You, have to, you just put on this four-cornered garment, you get all the berachot, and it's shakul, keneged kola mitzvot batorah. It's equal to all the mitzvot of the Torah. And there's a few ways that they, they come up with the um, gematria to do that. Every moment you're wearing tzitzit, you're fulfilling mitzvah from the Torah, as brought down in Igrot Moshe 4-4. Since it's a mitzvah that has, has become a habit throughout Amisel, it's almost an obligation, but not. It's almost an obligation, but not an obligation. Now, it's important. I went to Yeshiva of Flatbush High School, and we had a lot of, it was a Zionist school, and there were a lot of Zionist students there, and they were very proud of being Jewish, but not proud enough to wear a tzitzit. They were proud enough to only wear a kippah. They would walk in the street with a kippah, and they were very proud of it. And I was, uh, I'm a Sephardi guy, I was in Yeshiva of Flatbush. I would walk around with no kippah, with tzitzit. And so we had two different individuals here. We had one individual who was walking around the city of Manhattan with tzitzit on myself, and and I, and I made an assumption that you get a mitzvah deoraita every single second you're wearing it, you get a beracha. While the other individual doesn't want to wear tzitzit. Tzitzit was uh, too much of a burden, it wasn't un- uncomfortable, it's itchy, it's too much, but he wore kippah. Because then he was a proud Jew. But to be a proud Jew, you wear tzitzit and a kippah. Obviously, I know that today, or cover your head in any way you want, even with a hat. It's 100% kasher, but the ikad is, is, is tzitzit. The tzitzit is the ikad, much more than than the kippah uh, that you have, especially if you're Sephardim, because Sephardim in the old country, we many times did not wear uh, head coverings, just as an important note, but we wore tzitzit. Even those that didn't wear kippah, they did wear tzitzit. For Sephardim, the mitzvah of, uh, uh, the, of the Torah of wearing talit katan should be done with a wool fabric for Sephardim. Ashkenazim, they can get away with cotton, but Sephardim is wool. So this is brought down in the Shulchan Aruch 9-1. Now, it's interesting that a few years ago, the, the wools were very uncomfortable. Uh, and so what did I do? I went online. I went, happens to be, I'll give you the name of the shop I went to. Um, you know, I haven't been uh, gotten anything from them, no promotion, and it's not a paid advertisement. But the name of the business in Israel is called Ben Talit Shop. Over there, the guy literally has all different types of fabrics, wools, uh, uh, strings, materials. And when I went online, I bought the, the, the lightest weight, most comfortable uh, material of wool. 
to the level that when you wear it, it's extremely comfortable. I have it on with me, me now. And when I bomb, I only buy the good ones. Why? Because it's mitzvah de oraita. Which one do you have? I bought, I bought the wool CT, but the one that's very, very thin, one like a, a thin quality one. Even it, No, it's wool. That's nylon. So nylon and okay? Or polyester. That is, but that's, that's only from the rabbis, the mitzvah. When it comes to the Torah, the, the right one would be wool, along with wool tzitziot. Because the garment and the strings need to be from the same fabric. So, now, some opinions say that Eshkenazim should also wear a wool talit katan to fulfill the obliga- obligation since it's a mitzvah from the Torah, as brought down Mishnah Bidran 9-5, Halichot Shalomo 3-25, by the name of Rav Shlomo Zoman Ayabach. Now, Igrot Moshe 1-2 also breaks it down. Now, although today Rav Chaim Kanievsky, um, it was known that Rav Chaim Kanievsky only wore cotton tzitziot. That's what I heard. I never saw him take it off and show it to me. But from my understanding, Rav Chaim Kanievsky only wore cotton. Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi. But I'm trying. I'm, I'm saying because we're mentioning Ashkenazim here, you should know that he held uh, uh, that it was uh, cotton. Would it be like me? Your Ashkenazi would wear the same kafara. You would wear. You would wear wool. Now at this point, doctor, you're here all the time. You understand the laws, the customs. Uh, I don't know if you eat rice on Pesach uh, to that extent. But if you do, then uh, you, if you're already following all those Sfaradi halachot. I would tell you to wear wool. You would only have what to gain on it. Um, now, uh, I, I'm not going to go into this in depth now, uh, but I did do a research in regards to all the fabrics that are written in the Torah, in the five books, the Hamishah Shet Torah, which means every single fabric that was ever listed. I looked at wool, linen, uh, uh, silk, and all, all of them. Then I, I looked online for a few scientific research um, uh, papers that measure the energy that comes from different garments. It should be noted that synthetic garments have an energy of close to zero. Now, there are garments that will give you higher energies, like linen. Another one is wool. And there are different energies that can be tested. You can't mix them with and frequencies. Yes, when you mix, happens to be when you mix wool and linen, they cancel out right. and they go down to zero, which is unbelievable. The, I even looked further to see if, the, if it would get canceled out with different levels, meaning not if they were interchanged as like you have one, one uh, thread wool, one thread linen. I was talking about wearing a linen shorts with a wool top. And the maskana, according to the report, they do cancel out. And that's why some of the hachamim say not to do it. Um, so it's, the best is cotton? No, the best is always to wear wool. No, in my knowledge, uh, wool. Cotton, uh, wool, uh, wool linen. or linen. You could wear tzitziot that made out of linen. The only thing is, you need the linen strings on them. So it's a little bit... And, and so we, we use wool. And plus, wool is more comfortable. So, uh, uh, um, especially in the winter and in certain conditions, the wool can be very comfortable. On it. It's recommended to sleep with the talit katan if a person can do it. It's, it's not hayah because you're not hayah and tzitzit at night. Why? Because it says, Udi item oto. You see them. And the time for seeing is during the daytime, not the nighttime. Don't forget, we only have electricity since the 1800s. Before electricity, nighttime was nighttime. It was dark. It's not like today. Nighttime today is daytime. The city and the world that never sleeps. Okay. What would be considered nighttime today to take off your tzitzit? What once is, I would say, shkia or tzit. Tzit takochavit. You're not obligated. If you leave it on, you get you get extra credit. But you, you're not no obligated. We're talking about the obligation. So the obligation again to review was wool tzitzit with the wool strings during the daytime. And so what was one of the reasons why they recommend sleeping is because not everybody wakes up at the crack of dawn on Lotha Shachat. Sometimes he wakes up at seven o'clock minyan. So that means he was sleeping during the daytime without tzitzit. But if he went to sleep at night with tzitzit, he would wake up the early hours of the morning already covered wearing tzitzit. And if it speaks to you. Maybe, if, you know, do it on Shabbat, maybe do it on Yom Tov, do it on Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah. You, you can take it upon yourself once in a while if you don't want to do it every day. You know, don't, don't, Yesed Hara, what does he do? He tells you, look, if you can't change your life forever, then don't do it. He loves to play that game with you. He plays the game, he tells you, listen, if you can't make the change permanently, don't do it. But when it comes to Averot, he doesn't tell you that. He doesn't tell you, okay, if you can, if you, if you can do the Avera, do the Avera every day, he tells you, no, do it one time and have a good day. Because he just wants to get you once. So we do the same thing to him back. We tell him, okay, listen, we're going to do the mitzvah only once. It's okay, we'll do it once. And then we do it a second time and a third time. You play the same game on, the, on him. 
So I don't want to have to commit for, for the rest of my life. I do it, I do it as a day to day. Just like he does with Averot, I tell him we do with Mitzvot. Also, it's good to see with the Kippah. He write, uh, and as he brings the down by Mishnah, but not two dash 11, uh, that a person, if he wants to, you can see for the Kippah. It's a good custom. After bathing, washing and getting out of a pool or the Tevila, it's important to immediately put on the Kippah. That's brought down the Benish Hai by Ishlach 17. Now, a Ben Torah's clothing. Now, before we continue, um, it says in the Zichut of a few things we got, we got out of Egypt, right? Lo shinu et lishonam malbusham, right? Lishonam malbusham and, and shemotam, the, the name. So the three things they didn't change. One of them is malbusham, the clothing. So I've always had a question on the, on the clothing part of them. Because I said to myself, what do you mean the clothing? What clothing were they wearing? And, and what? Are we wearing the clothing that they wore back then? That well, are we not going to be no. redeemed? Are we not going to be redeemed? Yeah, they they wore. And by the way, they wore cloaks. They wore jalabiyas, these long tunics. That there's a reason why they wore them because it was very modest to the to the male form. Just like there's modesty with females, there's modesty with males. It's not well advertised today, but there is a form of modesty where you also don't see the the body of a male. There's something to it. And so they didn't change the clothes. So I always said to myself, all right, well, I mean, we have Shemotam, okay? Leshonam we have. We still speak Hebrew, Lashon HaKodesh. We still have our Jewish names. But when it came to the garment, we're not wearing Jalabiyas anymore for the most part. Maybe in Israel you have a few, or have Amnon Yishak, you have a couple that still wear it. But the Gedolim, even the Sephardi Gedolim don't wear them. Unless, unless, on oh, Friday night, unless, unless you're going to say that Malabusham, their clothing, was not the Jalabiyah, even though it says in the in Torah, sim, 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 latecha, lo adecha, even though that does the simla was talking about a male dress, which is a jalabiye, not today, what male dresses are, unfortunately, what, what has happened. So what is the garment? The garment is tzitzit. That was the garment that, that they didn't take. My only question on this was, tzitzit was not given to them until later on. So how could that be that garment? I don't know, that was a question I had, and never really got an answer to it, because the CT only came later, so how could that have been one of it? Uh, I'm not really sure. Okay, the Ben Torah's clothing. Actually, there's no clear rule about what type or club, color of clothing a Ben Torah must wear. It's very important to know this, very important, because today we make ourselves feel, remember we were talking yesterday about feeling versus intellect, that garments are going to determine our religious stature. And it's not the case. However, the tradition for several years has been dark pants and a white shirt. This is a tradition that came from the uh, European yeshiva system. This is for two main reasons. We're the children of kings of a king's world, and we're in front of him every moment of our lives. Therefore, we should always dress presentably. This is there's the big thing behind dressing presentably. A suit with a white shirt is elegant and has been honorable in recent years. Fashion has been changing, and that influences us being fashionable. So staying out of the fashion world of having something, a simple dress, dark pants, white shirt, or even a blue shirt, a light colored shirt, something that's just simple, always had a ma'ala. Make, makes everyone want to get involved with civilization, but it can also lead us to feel that we're the same as other people. And a son of the king, a prince, is special and different from others. That's why we shouldn't follow fashion. By dressing differently, we also behave differently. With the suit and a white shirt, we can feel closer to the religious environment. I can tell you that uh, when it came to the yeshiva, I believe in Slobodka, and they originally had put together their students, they went, the students were all very poor students, and none of them really had money even for food or even to go to yeshiva. And when the Rosh Yeshiva had gathered them, what was the first thing he did to lift them up and to show them the gadlut of mankind, of the human being? He went and he bought them very expensive shoes, shoes, shirts, suits, and hats, and he dressed them all up, and he told them, you are great people. Now you have to learn great Torah, teach great Torah, work on your midot, and it worked. And when I read that and I saw it, I understood that the way you treat yourself, the way you see yourself, is the way others see you, and that has an importance because it's going to affect your mentality of how your mind will understand and see yourself. You know, in the subconscious uh, mind, for sure, that when you dress in a certain way, you're not going to do certain things. 
when you, if you're wearing a tank top and flip-flops and shorts, you're going to feel one way as to wearing a nice, respectful uh, you know, garment uh, and, and being in civilization. Uh-huh. The, So that's why we're saying here, listen, you, today, Baruch Hashem, you can wear very nice clothing, fitted clothing, you know, I don't even call it fashionable, but fashionable clothing without showing off. It's very possible today. Today, there's a lot of, today, the mass market for quality, fashionable clothing, uh, and even modest clothing, I would call it, um, is it, it's very, uh, very easy to acquire, and you don't have to show off with it. It used to be that case, but okay, you don't, he doesn't have to wear himself a $500 belt. He can wear himself regular clothing without showing off any logos and, and, and brands. You know, that's another part of the fashion world today, is that they buy things that have fashionable names on them and brands in order to show off that they have those brands. The Gemara says, A Talmid Hacham or a Ben Torah whose clothes are dirty or he looks careless is Hayav Mita, death penalty. Deserving a death note. Now that's brought down Masechah Shabbat 114a. The question is, why is this so serious if he didn't transgress Shabbat or eat bread on Pesach? Since when does wearing dirty clothing or improper clothing deem itself for Hayav Mitah? That's a pretty harsh decree. Uh, Rav Nisimi again explains, since Tamidei Chachamim are representatives of Hashem, they always have to be totally neat. And... If their clothes are dirty, that's considered a chilul Hashem. Of course, no one carries the flag of a prince, uh, of a ben Torah, in that way. And this brought down Rav Nisimi again in Netive Or. We have to remember the words of the Midrash. For four reasons were we saved from Mitzrayim, like we mentioned earlier. For not changing our names, the Yehudim. For not changing our clothing, as Yehudim. And for not revealing our secrets. That was the fourth one. This is a different ma'amar than the one we mentioned earlier. And for continuing the mitzvah of Brit Milah. So this, this is a different ma'amad brought down here in Midrash Lekach Tov Shemot 6-6. So you have Shemotam, Leshonam, and Shemam, and then you have this other one here. Not chasing after brands. Obviously, we need to buy clothes, but do they have to be special brands that cost, cost several times the normal price just so that people can see us? Of course, we don't have to walk in worn clothes but choose a middle-of-the-way path without going to any extreme as the Rambam teaches. Now, when the Rambam had what's called Shvil HaZahav, the golden middle path, that golden middle path was not talking about Torah, Mitzvot, and Halakha. It was talking about materialistic and non-Torah things. That was his middle of the path. When it came to Torah, Harambam was mahmir on everything that he can to follow it to the letter of the law. But when it came to materialistic things, he said, don't go far right, don't go far left, and go down the center. The Gemara says that the Yetzir Hara is just like a fly, as brought down in Masechet Berachot 61a. Just as the fly bothers and continues bothering, the Yetzir Hara bothers people and doesn't stop working. That's why the Kliyakar explains the Pasuk, Vayivater Yaakov Levado. The Yaakov was by himself. The fly, the Zvu, stopped bothering him. The fly is only found in dirty places, but not in clean ones. The same thing happens with the Yetzirah. He only enters people when there's some dirt on them. And if someone lets him in, he lowers his spiritual level. Yosef HaSadiq had the merit of considering himself Sadiq because of the willpower he had in defeating the Yetzirah when Potiphar's wife seduced him. The question is, how is it possible that Yosef had a Yetzirah if he was a true Sadiq? I thought if he's a Sadiq, he has no Yetzirah. And surely he didn't let the Yitzhah Hara into his life. As a side note, that's absolutely not true. It says that as a person becomes greater, so does his Yitzhah Hara. So when you see a great Talmud Hacham, a big rabbi, a big Sadiq, and you know his righteousness, then you have to know his Yitzhah Hara is as big as the righteousness that you see. He's just suppressing it so well that, that it's, not, it's not visible and not coming out. Actually, Yosef did let the Yitzhah Hara into his life, when the Torah says about him, Behu Na'at, he was young, as brought down in Bereshit 37-2, Rashi explains that Yosef behaved like the young, which means he fixed his hair, his eyes, and etc. And the Mefarshim write why that was the case, because originally, or, or, originally, he was supposed to be born as a female. She, it was supposed to be a she. What happened? When Leah got pregnant, 
she noticed she was having child number seven. What that meant already is that she already had six boys, and Bilha, uh, Zilpa already had two boys, Bilha had two boys, and she realized if she has a seven, that means that her sister Rachel would only have one boy, and that the maidservant would have more boys than her sister who was a primary wife. So she had prayed that Hashem would switch the gender in her belly, which was going to uh, establishing itself as a male into a female, and switch it up with, with Rachel, who was pregnant at the time, with a female. So what ended up happening is Leah gave birth to Dina, and Rachel gave to Yosef. So Yosef, to a certain extent, had certain characteristic traits that were similar to female, like fixing his hair, his eyes, and certain things. Not that Hasb Shalom, that was uh, something that he focused on, but rather that was his, ingrained in his nefesh from before he even was brought into the world. And when it came to Dina, Dina ended up going out to see the, the, the Benot Kananiyot and to go out, and she ended up getting you know, uh, taken from Shechem ben Hamor and violated. But why did she have that trait to go out? Because she originally was ingrained as being a male who go out. And so when, uh, later on, when that uh, ended up happening, Dina ends up having a, a daughter from the illicit relation with Shechem ben Hamor, Asenat. Asenat ends up getting sent down to Mitzrayim, and Yosef ends up marrying. So both of the families, which changed originally the souls from Dina to Rachel, ended up reconnecting later on uh, with that marriage. And then he entered, uh, and okay, we have to be very careful not to allow in the Yetzir Hara. When he enters, it's very difficult to get him out. This applies both in Kashrut, Sini'ut, and Shabbat, as well as with the Shonara. The more we worry about not bringing the Yetzir into our lives, the more he won't enter. As brought on Rav Nisimi again in Netive or Pesach, page 129. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.